Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass Piancy, and I'm joined as usual by my partner in crime, Mr. Bennett Tomlin. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you, Cass? Fine. We're joined by a special guest who has been at the um, courthouse in some way, shape, or form uh, the past week going and watching the Sam Bankman Freed trial. Sam Kessler from Coindesk. How are you? Hello. Hello. Long time, first time. This is pretty <laughs> cool. Thanks, Cass and Bennett. We haven't recorded since any of the defense's witnesses have taken the stand. Um, so I wanted to get us kicked off with those individuals, if we could, and what they were supposed to accomplish for the defense. We were talking about the, the I guess it was the data scientist guy. Joseph Pimbley. So there was him and Crystal Roll, who's um, a Bahamian right. attorney um, who worked for um, works for for Sam. Yeah, well, let's start with Pim let's start with Pimbley because it sounds boring in terms of what he was sent there to accomplish. Actually, can you explain what his goal was for the defense? Sounds boring and it was boring remarkably compared to the rest of this trial. But essentially, Pimbley is a um, you know data analyst who was hired on the behalf of Sam's team to kind of come in and assemble some documents that show. Um, it, I mean, it, it's hard to know exactly how they they plan to use these documents or you know these 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 data, but essentially charts showing that Alameda liquidity and FTX liquidity was um, at a certain level um, over the course of 2021 through 2022, the fall of the exchange that you know makes it look like there was more money on hand um, than um, you know what prosecutors would probably allege. Yeah, and we were all just kind of stunned at the prices this guy was able to get from the, I guess, I, essentially the Bankman Freed family. I, I would assume that that's who's ultimately paying this man's bills. Uh, he did 73 hours of work or something and got paid $50,000, yeah. which is, um, I think all of us are kind of just wishing we had rates like that. Unfortunately, it sounds like he didn't help win any hearts or minds in terms of people there or the jury, I would I would presume. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to get into the mind of the jury. But I mean, the way that this went was essentially he um, presented these documents. And then the prosecution came up. And the, the main, I guess, thrust of the prosecution's questions, or if you want to call it argument um, to the jury um, with their questions to Pimley was, was essentially, hey, uh, where did these numbers come from? Oh, they came from Sam and his lawyers. So the database that you based all of your analysis on came directly from um, the client. And then there were, you know, several more questions after that. And I think they actually belabored that too much and might have actually lost some sway with with the jury as a result of that, you know, extensive questioning. Yikes. I know. I know the second one was uh, you mentioned Christina Roll. No. So it's funny. It um, you said Roll. Christina Roll. It is Chris. There is a Christina role and there is no relation. And there was a point made. <laughs> Please. Yeah, go ahead. What was that point? Because I, that was what I was going to say, too. What was the point that was made in court? So um, Christina role is a very important Bahamian regulator um, kind of behind the, the country's embrace of crypto. And Crystal role is a unrelated, um, which she made very clear because role in her telling <laughs> is a very common name there. She's an unrelated um, lawyer who works for Sam and accompanied him when he talked to the um, Securities Commission of the, the Bahamas, I think if I'm getting the name of the agency correctly. Yeah. And and just to add some color, some color to what you just said is that from what I heard, Roll is actually the most common Bahamian surname out there, like the first or second most common Bahamian surname, and which like I'm, I don't know, that's just all of these weird little things yeah. that I'm that I'm fascinated by. There were three roles in her testimony alone uh, <laughs> that she had to distinguish. So I heard that that also was a pretty unsuccessful defense tactic in so far as her role in all of this was only post collapse, which kind of negates a bit of yeah. what she's saying and why, why it matters. Uh, can you expand on that for me? I mean, with a lot of this stuff, they're asking a lot of questions that are they being lawyers from both sides that can seem disjointed. And sometimes it's because they want to enter things into the record. Sometimes it's because they want to tee up other questions that they're going to ask Sam during his testimony, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and I think that her main goal was to corroborate the timeline and substance of his meetings with Bahamian regulators. One kind of contentious thing is just that, um, you know, Sam 
essentially froze a bunch of money um, or took a bunch of frozen money and gave it to, um, you know, the Bahamas um, to in a very, you know, bad summary of how, how that worked. But, you know, it, it can seem like a sort of cynical thing that he was willing to kind of kowtow to the Bahamians in order to, um, in the view of prosecutors, I'm sure, get preferential treatment there. But I think part of her goal, Crystal um, Roll's goal with her testimony was to kind of communicate, hey, if he didn't do these things, that the Bahamas wanted him to do, he would have gone to prison or faced um, severe penalties. I mean, I, that gets us through the first the the first expert witnesses. Do you have any more questions about them, Bennett? No, I, my first question start on Bankman Freed. Then let's jump into the uh, the weird circumstances uh, of I, you called it a mock trial. I mean, I I guess I don't really. It's all on record still, but it is without a jury present, and everyone seemed a little stunned by that. Essentially, without going into the legal details, because um, A, nobody you know wants to get super deep into that, and B, I don't understand it um, as a journalist, not a lawyer. Um, you know, part of Sam's defense um, strategy rested on using his lawyers and the advice that he received from counsel while at FTX to kind of make the point that at least he, if he didn't have bad counsel, that he at least was following the advice of counsel. And that is a kind of important legal distinction. Um, and they wanted to present essentially this evidence that right or wrong, he got counsel while he was at FTX and Alameda. And that's what he followed, which led him to think that certain business decisions that the prosecutors say were fraudulent were legal. And the judge, um, in deciding whether to admit this argument, this kind of argument into court, did this weird thing where he dismissed the jury and held a hearing, which essentially was like a mock trial where Sam and his, um, well, Sam was questioned by his lawyers. Um, they did their direct, you know, questioning um, and, uh, you know, focused specifically on these sorts of questions, this weird legal gray area. And then he was also crossed, meaning the prosecutors got to question him as well, not in front of a jury, but he was still under oath. So it's kind of this confusing thing to help the judge ostensibly make a decision on what to admit. Yeah. And I think the technical name for it is evidentiary hearing. I called it a mock trial because that's more evocative than evidentiary hearing, but we should probably be, you know, slightly more accurate. And after this, the only piece that I believe was admissible from this advice of counsel defense was that Sam Bankman Freed did receive advice from Daniel Friedberg on document retention, and that part was going to be allowed into the trial. Did I appropriately understand the results of that uh, evidentiary hearing? Yeah, I think that's a, a fair summary. I mean, and a key thing uh, backing up from the results is that Sam and his team really kind of threw Dan Friedberg, I mean, whether he threw himself under the bus or, um, you know, however you want to um, look at it. Um, he was a huge focus of that section of testimony. And yeah, that might backfire. It might have backfired huh, for him. I this I wrote a piece uh, yesterday or whenever this it'll when this comes out, it'll be last week. But I wrote a piece saying that this is Sam Bankman Fried's kamikaze defense. And I think that like <laughs> that is what that's what that that evidenti evidentiary hearing made me feel was like, this guy is going to and I just want to run through some of the things he said. And, you know, these aren't exact ways that he said them. But the, the, some of the things he said that I'm like, oh, if regulators or three letter agencies want to deal with this, there might be something here for them. Um, the first one that springs to mind, he talked about Jane Street and he said that they typically told employees to delete chats and uh, use signal. The New York Times test. I'm like, OK, well, that's probably not something Jane Street wants in court from someone under oath. Keep in mind that as as we're saying here, like this, while there was no jury present, he still couldn't lie. This was essentially to get mm -hmm. a, a he can't <laughs> legally lie. <laughs> It's yeah. against the law for him to lie. And we know that yeah. if anything, Bankman Freed loves the law. I mean, he can also forget. He can forget. And he did that a lot. He's doing a great um, job. He of might that. remember on Monday. So we'll see. The other thing I wanted to bring up was that he definitely threw Kansun and uh, Friedberg under the bus and tried to make it about 
them and how they were culpable and he wasn't culpable. They put the contracts in front of him. It wasn't his fault, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then definitely like trying to get Caroline, Gary, Nashad, and all of his other coworkers involved in some way, shape or form. I'm honestly a little surprised he didn't throw his parents under the bus at this point. Um, but like it, it feels like anyone who he's ever known, he's looking to at least implicate them if not get off because of them, right? Like, which is just, I don't know, it's wild to see that play out in real life. And it's a weird needle to thread too, because it's like, hey, it's their fault, but also nothing was wrong. Um, and kind of trying to, to you know, <laughs> make both of those things true in a lot of these cases uh, can prove difficult and at least vague and weird from the standpoint of a jury, I'd imagine. When they brought up Daniel Friedberg, the prosecution took a couple of different tacks in their attempt to suggest he was a less than stellar lawyer when he was hired by FTX. Do you have any thoughts on that particular part? That's kind of why I mentioned that this could backfire because prosecutors asked the question, were something to the effect of, were you aware um, that Daniel Friedberg was taking illegal narcotics with employees of Alameda and FTX. Um, that, that was, was a, fucking you know, one, crazy. That was like the last question. Yeah, it was wild. I, I mean, and there's other questions that kind of come up to that line. I want to add in here that while we're discussing this, the judge admonished uh, Danielle Sassoon for saying that and said like how like kind of like yes. was just shocked that she had decided to bring this up. She knew better essentially, um, and that clearly. Whether or not that's true, which I'm not going to weigh in on, it didn't need to be a part of this trial. Um, so I just want to like make sure that the audience understands that the, that there was pushback on this and it wasn't just allowed to go into like evidence or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I think it was almost like a warning to to Sam and the judge. It's like, all right, if you want to kind of bring this in, you know, the gloves are off. Um, and this, I mean, one other thing that they said that was, uh, in my mind, a little bit more substantive was, um, and this is where the Better Call Saul analogy comes in, is they kind of try to bring up this narrative where Sam was looking for um, a lawyer who would kind of just give him a green flag for whatever he wanted to do. There were questions like, oh, you know, did you tell such and such that you didn't like lawyers or that, you know, if you had a lawyer, you wanted one who would, you know, give you, you know, a green light for for whatever. And it kind of reminds me of the Breaking Bad thing where it's like, you know, do you want a lawyer or do you want a criminal lawyer, a criminal lawyer or a criminal lawyer? Um, not saying that's, you know, at all, you know, they're, they're, this is in court. They're trying to make arguments, paint pictures and not saying that's at all what happened here. But they did kind of invoke a similar sort of. Uh, you know, refrain in that testimony. Yeah, and they did also take their time during the questioning to mention Daniel Friedberg's previous role at Excapsa, the parent company and software provider for like Ultimate Bet during the entire um, God Mode scandal where people there could see the cards of people playing in the games, allowing poker players to cheat. For the record, Daniel Friedberg is not the only prominent cryptocurrency lawyer to work at Excapsa during that period, with their chief compliance officer being one Stuart Hogner, who is now the general counsel, of course, for Bitfinex <laughs> and Tether. Small world. Um, just wanted that extra bit of context that the <laughs> prosecutors brought up during that evidentiary heating, hearing mentioned as well in the context of Daniel Friedberg. Yeah, so anyway, it was crazy. I mean, to sum it up, it, it didn't go well for Sam, by the way. Um, I don't know if we like made that clear enough, but at least in my read. I think the most stunning part of this, God, even reflecting on this makes me just, I just, it hurts my brain, is uh, they started a line of questioning and then the defense asked him asked him a question and SBF's lawyer Cohen objected and then it, the judge said sustained like like okay this is you know like yeah the objection is good like don't answer this question to which Sam then answered the question and so his own lawyer goes why did you answer this question haven't you been here for 4 weeks i i should say no i i should say this is where there is like one benefit um, to being um, like one of the few benefits to waking up early and being in that courtroom is that was kind of a lighter moment. So what you're talking, the, the question was a something to the effect of, did you embezzle money? And, mm -hmm. you know, it, um, and, uh, you know, Cohen, Sam's lawyer objected. Um, the, uh, you know, the judge said sustained. Um, and Sam was like, no. And everybody laughed. 
Um, and that was like with a smile, Cohen said, Hey, you know, you've been here for weeks, you know, you don't have to answer that. And Sam like laughed and he was like, yeah, I just kind of thought I should (laughs) answer that one. And the judge was smiling too. So anyway, (laughs) but yeah, plays differently. Sure. And it is also, it still is idiotic, right? Because you should be listening to your lawyer. Like what in God's name are you doing? Holy crap. Um, which just leads everyone to believe, I think, that Sam Bankman Fried is absolutely taking the stand against the advice of his lawyers, probably against the advice of his par- his parents, um, and that he still believes that he can talk his way out of this, or at least, as I as I pointed out, drag everyone down with him. On a very basic level, was there anything new that you learned from Bankman Fried's testimony about how Alameda or FTX worked that you thought was insightful or valuable? There are some things, and I can't say that they were all brand new to everybody, um, but at least color for me. So there was some stuff that he brought up around a hack, or it wasn't really a hack, but, um, you know, this mobile coin um, exploit um, where, you know, somebody was essentially able to borrow a ton on margin. And when these token prices shot up, they, they were essentially able to borrow against worthless tokens and really kind of imperil the um, the, the site um, um, or the platform rather. And so the he gave like a bit of a step by step that's not worth getting into around that situation that was at least interesting color. Um, there was also some stuff about the allow negative feature and why they implemented it. We'll get we can get to this. I don't know his timeline uh, did not really square with what we saw in evidence earlier in the trial. Um, but you know his rationale for why it happened was at least somewhat interesting. Um, but the, broadly, and I don't want to be get anything wrong here there was no smoking gun um if that's even the word in this context that was like hey you know you think this but it's actually this i think what you're kind of getting at there that there wasn't really anything that made his story like a different explanation that reasonably explained how the things happened without implicating him it's kind of the impression i kept getting from his testimony like in the course of it he repeatedly referred to the margin facility that ftx has as he did in his pre in his media tour pre arrest but my understanding was that the analysis done by uh, the people after the fact pointed out that the hole in FTX was larger than like the total amount of funds people had in the margin facility. And so it still seems to me like he's pointing at some level at defenses that have already been blown up and pretending they're still standing. Am I missing something in that? No, you're not missing. I, I, I'd suggest too that people read Liz Lopato's piece um, on Friday's testimony in The Verge, because I think she does the best breakdown that I've seen of just like point by point kind of some of these things that you're talking about, Bennett. Broadly, I think what he did on Friday was he just put together different timelines and kind of made himself seem, you know, he painted the picture of this guy who's more of an advisor than he was a boss, um, you know, a person pulling the strings. Um, he, I mean, none of this was surprising either. This is what he was going to do. But he also, you know, made it look like certain deputies of his were the ones behind um, not just key decisions, but, you know, actions that, At least plausibly, some of it I could understand where it's like, hey, I told these people to do, you know, one thing and then they went off and did it in a way that I didn't expect. And I'm kind of actually fascinated by this because as you're talking, you keep uh, mentioning, thankfully, I'm not the one having to mention Liz Lopato a bunch this episode. Uh, Sam is doing it for me. (laughs) Um, Do you do that? But do you do that frequently? She's come up in every single episode that we've (laughs) that we've done so far. In her piece, she talks about one of I'm so glad she brought this up because someone asked uh, Sam Bankman Fried years ago, um, or maybe a year or two ago, whatever it was, um, about why he had chosen the name Alameda Research. And he very explicitly explained that the reason he had mm-hmm. chosen the name Alameda Research was because it sounded not like we're trading cryptocurrencies and shit coins because banks don't like if you're doing that and they didn't want to lose their banking. So they were going to make sure that mm-hmm. banks thought they were just a research firm. And so that mm-hmm. sounds a lot more like bank fraud than what his explanation was. Can you tell me what his explanation was? I mean, that was in um, the the Lewis book as well for for all that's been said on both ends um, about that. I think that's kind of the general accept, generally I- accepted history uh, of what went on there. Called it Alameda Research because it's sounds more legit and not crypto-y. Um, and, you know, in his telling, it's like, oh, we kind of named it after a town in California. Um, and it was better than the other name, which was like Wireless Mouse. 
um, which, you know, it is. Anyway, that's his story. It's much more, it, 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 it seems a lot less um, pointed, um, his choice to rename things. It wasn't all about distancing himself from crypto and hiding what they were doing. Though he did, even in his telling and the stand mention, like, I think he said, we didn't want it to be called Sam's crypto trading firm. We wanted it to be under the radar. So he is still kind of hinting at the same thing, right? Right. When he said that, it was like with an eye towards competitors, which was interesting, though. Um, where sure. it wasn't about like banking relationships and so on. At least my recollection was that it was about like competitors and such. But Bennett, correct me. And that lines up a little bit with kind of uh, Michael Lewis's telling of his leaving of Jane Street, right? He believed mm -hmm. that there was this massive inefficiency in the crypto market. And he kind of anticipated, if you take as literal the descriptions in that portion of uh, Lewis's book, he thought he only had perhaps 12 months, perhaps 18 months, something to potentially like take advantage of this inefficiency before other firms started moving in. So that at least fits with what other people have said about him at some level. I mean, coincidentally, um, I was actually seated next to, to, to Michael Lewis yesterday morning, um, like during the open of his, you know, Sam's whole, um, you know, testimony in front of jurors. Um, and at least, um, you know, my Michael Lewis um, did not seem um, surprised by anything that Sam said, um, which kind of I, I should have said that before, which kind of goes to what we're talking about now, but also what you were asking earlier around whether we've learned anything super, super, super new. This is kind of the narrative that he's laid out with the exception of some of these weird things like this naming of Alameda research where they're reframed. Um, for for a jury. Yeah, it just goes against hasn't that video actually been entered into evidence of Sam saying what it was actually for, which was essentially bank fraud? Like, I thought that that video had been entered into evidence uh, as an exhibit. And if so, it goes like, if I was a juror, I would be like, uh, which one do I trust the the version of Sam Bankman Fried that feels like he doesn't have to lie about it and is just talking openly on a podcast? or the one that's here under oath. Like, I know which one I'm going to believe, but I guess I'm not a juror, so luckily. I, I guess I'm more sympathetic to, to Sam's view of this is it was more, it wasn't that he directly, I think, disputed that video and why he named things the way he did. It's just that, you know, he might have also chosen Alameda because it was a town in California and he might have also liked it better than Wireless Mouse. So that's not necessarily a lie as much as it is a very convenient, you know, excerpt of the the truth. Fair enough. Uh, yeah. So those I do. I did want to bring that up just because it seems like untrustworthy witness and i'm i'm wondering if that is the sense that that is felt in the courtroom maybe just from the journalists but i i assume journalists feel that way just because they they re remember the apology tour that he did post collapse but i i guess i'm i'm wondering if like there's a sense that this is the way it's coming across in court as well everything is going to hinge on the cross um when danielle sassoon the very capable prosecutor who will be asking him questions starting on Monday has a chance to kind of dig into his testimony. Um, and that's the most important thing. I do think, though, if we're to back up a little bit and just, you know, look at his testimony from Friday, he, in my view, did a pretty good job of explaining things clearly, coming off as sympathetic and like a kind person, if that's even a fair, you know, characterization. Um, but like he, you know, he was very upbeat. He seemed confident. He seemed poised. He didn't actually seem as scripted as some others, even though he was clearly well prepared, like he was coached, but he didn't seem to have his, you know, all of his things narrow, like word for word nailed down. Um, I don't think he did a poor job, but it almost doesn't matter because the cross is where it's really all of these. And I also don't think, by the way, that the jury is going to pick up on most of these little nuances and distinctions that we've been talking about here because we've been following this for a year um, on top of, you know, really scrutinizing these transcripts in a way that I doubt the jury's able to do. Were there any differences between Sam Bankman Freed's testimony and those of other people in the inner circle that you want to highlight or draw attention to? The first one that was pretty glaringly different from previous testimony centered around the quote unquote, special privileges. I don't think that's the word that Sam ever used in his testimony, but the prosecutors used to describe these privileges that Alameda had on the FTS exchange that other market makers and customers, clients of FTX did not have. 
the key one being this allow negative feature, which um, altogether kind of allowed Alameda to withdraw um, infinite money, um, you know, not get liquidated. You know, I don't know if that was all grouped under this allow negative thing, but it, it all kind of grew into this like big set of, you know, basket of capabilities for Alameda, Sam's own firm. Briefly in the Shad and Gary Wang's telling, they in 2019 implemented a version of this allow negative feature that feature uh, was to kind of accomplish the, in, even in their, you know, um, testimony, more innocuous role of backstopping uh, certain bad bugs or things that could happen with liquidity providers, market makers on um, FTX. It was like this weird kind of like fix patch sort of a thing. I, whether you believe that or whatever is besides the point. But anyway, they say it started in 2019. And then over the years, the capabilities of this Kate, this, you know, function were expanded so much that, you know, Alameda could withdraw infinitely, um, pull out infinite lines of credit, so on and so forth. But anyway, that's the allow negative feature. In Sam's telling, he instructed Wang and Singh to implement a fix for a bug on the exchange, which he expected to be, you know, a sort of flag or something like that that would allow Alameda uh, or rather FTX to take action if Alameda's balance dropped below zero. So he thought it would be a, a flag or an alert, he said. But, you know, his deputies went off and implemented this thing that he says is the allow negative feature. But the timeline, this was years after 2019, his timeline. I'm wondering what you think the explanation is for such a large discrepancy in the timeline, because the, the timeline differs by like a year plus, right? Like, how is there yeah. such a large discrepancy between what Gary Wong and Nishad Singh think and when this happened and these meetings that occurred with Sam versus what Sam recollects as happening way later and with to under totally different circumstances? So he could have misremembered. <laughs> Um, he could have, uh, which we can probably throw that one out of the way. Um, he could have lied, um, like outright. Um, he could have instructed, you know, um, uh, either about the timeline or about his role. Um, he might have directed them to do exactly what the feature ultimately allowed, which was these infinite withdrawals. Or, which is much more sympathetic, but I think is also possible, is like, I, 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 I don't know. Um, I, I struggle with whether this makes sense, but I do think it might be possible that there was this kind of allow negative function in the code that they did implement in 2019, which was this more innocuous thing. And that what Sam was talking about on the stand on Friday was the expansion of the capabilities of the allow negative function, not the allow negative function itself. And so there is some, you know, I, 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 you think they'd be more explicit about that if that was the case, but I think you are exactly right that there was one version of it and then it got built on to form the other one. And I think that matches up with all of the timelines given so far, except for Sam pretending he didn't know when this feature was implemented. Because when FTX started, Alameda Research was approximately 50% of the total volume was the backstop liquidity provider for any trades that went wrong. And supposedly, like, that was like, Alameda was only supposed to then step in and it would then be covered by the backstop insurance fund, which as previously testified about did not actually exist and was just a random number they were putting in. This functioned for a while until the mobile coin issue where someone was able to take out this massive position and Alameda then as the backstop liquidity provider had to step in at an unreasonable price when they got liquidated. Sam Bankman Fried then testified about telling Gary Wang and Nishad Singh to go in and add in additional speed bumps for to erroneous liquidation. So I think what Sam Bankman Fried is talking about is Alameda Research's exemption from auto liquidation was, I think, added after MobileCoin. But I think the allow negative feature, based on all the testimony so far, predates that and goes back to Alameda's institution as the primary market maker and the backstop liquidity provider for FTX. And so what changed at this point is the exemption from automatic liquidation. And it was important for Alameda Research to be exempted from automatic liquidation because because they were still at this point the entire backstop liquidity provider. And so there were cases where if Alameda Research's own position was liquidated, they would end up on the bad side, on both the bad sides of that trade, having to effectively step in to fill their own false liquid, their own bad liquidation, right? And so by exempting Alameda Research from liquidation, you make it so Alameda Research never has to step in to fill in for Alameda Research's own bad trade. But that means the bad trade can now balloon 
because you've already implemented this allow negative related to all these other activities Alameda is doing. And then you end up after a variety of other bad decisions with an $8 billion hole. You just did a much more thorough um, and better job explaining that whole you know, thing that I said was kind of new to me um, in this testimony, which was explaining the rationale behind this feature. And I actually do find that as a sort of believable thing, whether or not um, he, what he knew about things, um, what he directed or didn't direct, um, you know, all those elements of his testimony, whether those things are true. But I do think I can see a world where it was a more benign sort of a thing that came about in result um, – um, you know, of these problems with how the exchange was architected. Well, I was going to have a bit of a digression about the risk engine. I, I just think it's interesting. At least we who have been following this know um, and been following FTX since before collapse know that this risk engine, this, you know, uh, cross margining system was supposed to be this state of the art thing um, that worked on FTX and for some reason really no other major exchanges. And the fact that that was uh, essentially false advertising, um, it seems at this point, that thing that you just explained, Bennett, actually undermines other pieces of, you know, Sam's case, exactly. case, which is that this was an up, you know, upright, you know, very straightforward, trustworthy business. Because um, if that stuff is true, uh, then the, the, this system did not work like he advertised it to have worked. Well, yes. And like in that very same vein, in his testimony to Congress, when he was effectively advocating for the DCCPA, we can discuss what he was actually doing. He talked about how he specifically said Alameda was not exempted from any of the like normal margin processes mm -hmm. on FTX as part of his testimony before the agricultural committee or whoever it was at the time. Mm -hmm. And so like him now saying, oh, I told them to put in speed bumps related to liquidation. That's, I imagine, could come up on cross. And like, I think more directly speaking to it, we're like, there might be more benign explanations for certain decisions made. Like the allow negative could have been mm -hmm. a choice made because of legitimate difficulties in moving certain assets. And it may have been made with good intentions. However, my trouble with Sam Bankman Freedom, whenever he starts trying to make it seem that way, is like often companies that are providing financial services are governed by a set of rules that only very barely touch on what your intentions are when you're doing certain things and very often describe what actions you're supposed to take. And at a basic level, you know, ha allowing your company to withdraw more assets than they have, regardless of whether or not you intend to do it or intend to do it a lot or only intend to do it for a couple days while you send money over to Circle and Tether or whatever, your intent only matters up to a point, especially when there's eight billion missing. Absolutely. Also, one thing that I, I feel like isn't talked about enough um, or hasn't been talked about enough since Friday is we do really need to allow for the possibility um, or probability that many elements of the testimony that we've heard up to this point from either Gary, Nishad, or Caroline and others has also been either, um, you know, embellished, um, manufactured um, for their own benefit. Like, it, it's not like Sam's the only one who uh, has to testify in a certain way to negate his own role in what happened. I'd like to pu push back on that a little bit, because I think the benefit of the arrangement that the government has with those witnesses is in that if they are caught lying or if they didn't share some information that they should have with the government, they're liable to do a shit ton of prison time because the government can still get them for any of that. And so it almost makes you go like, well, they're going to they're going to give themselves up for everything that they think they're even possibly close to having committed in terms of crimes. And and I think that is where I, I see it as like, it's hard to suggest that they're as unreliable as Sam Bankman Fried might. Well, yeah, and at a very basic level, all of them admit they committed crimes. Like Nishad, That's Gary, true. Carolyn, Ryan, they all say, I did crimes. I, I do want to go back to like something specific though, which is this bug feature or this, you know, allow negative feature that we're talking about. Um, let's look at like the kind of like Occam's razor version of this, um, which is, you know, Sam, Gary and Ashad in a room talking about things. Um, and 
I, I think it, it does make sense where they all kind of like have this vague sense of like how they were going to fix this bug or they were like, hey, we need to let them go more negative. Maybe it wasn't Sam who was like, hey, this is the solution. We need to do this thing. Um, but it, I, I think it's easy to kind of like construe that conversation. However, it went down as, hey, Sam told us to do a thing. We did exactly that thing. I can't imagine that it's that simple or maybe I, I mean, maybe it is. But I, I guess what I'm saying is it's not about like. You know, it's not I shouldn't say that they 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 it's likely that anybody outright, outright, outright lied. But I do think that there's like a way to believe and tell this story that does kind of inculcate your your own, you know, role in, in, in things. It's Nishad Singh talking about how bad he feels while buying his house. Right. It's Carolyn Ellison like being this. This was all such a relief to me when I finally got to be honest about all this and all that. Right. And it's probably at some level true they did feel bad or did feel relieved or whatever but by presenting that story or in like carolyn's case framing her relationship with sam in certain ways does i agree probably make certain things seem more striking now just to head back to sam's testimony and you know these you know holes that you can kind of poke by looking at past testimony um sam makes it seem like he didn't know about this hole or the you know in alameda and how it was, you know, using essentially FTX customer funds in effect um, until October of 2022, which was a month um, before it ultimately collapsed. Um, and that goes, you know, in, in the telling of all the other witnesses, he had a sense that things were, you know, going in this direction since, uh, at least June, um, as early as at least June of 2022. And that's just, you know, reconciling that statement with what we've heard from past witnesses is probably going to be a key point of focus for prosecutors. The point being, and this is why they needed those charts from Mr. Pimsley that we spoke about earlier, is they kind of want to make, you know, the prosecutors are going to want to show that Sam knew that he was drawing money. He knew about Alameda's finances, and he knew that because of the levels of assets and liabilities that, you know, he had to be in effect, drawing from customer funds because Alameda just did not have enough and FTX did not have enough of revenues to cover, you know, what he was drawing. Yeah, which to me means I expect we'll hear again about Alameda Research using FTX customer funds to buy back FTX equity before the Series B1, before the uh, 42069 round, because mm -hmm. that's way before all the other things, and Carolyn already testified that that was using FTX customer funds at Sam's explicit request. So I imagine we're going to hear that in the cross. An issue that I've been coming away with that I've been noticing is that, and, and you can scroll through the comments section of any of our videos, unfortunately, and see this, is that there's this large swath of the population. I'm not sure how much is actually represented by the kind of weirdos that I interact with on Twitter and on YouTube, there's this, there seems to be this belief that because of Sam's donations, because of his wealth, because of his background, because of who his parents are, because of who he knows, he's going to get off. He's not going to do any prison time. And it's hard for me to reconcile that perspective with the reality that I'm watching transpire in court. I know that you have to be open to the idea that there's a chance Sam Bankman Freed doesn't do any prison time. But can you kind of speak to how people feel about those odds in the courtroom and after watching this day in and day out? Things are not going well for Sam in court. Um, <laughs> my impression um, is at least that. I, I mean, the concern that you hear about, you hear that maybe they could actually file you know, for, for a mistrial because Judge Kaplan, who is overseeing the case and has shot down a bunch of Sam's proposed expert witnesses, frequently admonishes his defense, um, you know, more so than, than prosecutors in court. There, you know, people think that if there's any bias, it's – and I'm not backing this um, on either end. But if there's any bias you, you hear in the courtroom, it's actually against Sam's team. There's obviously some opaque – pieces of our justice system that I can't pretend to understand. But, you know, the Southern District of New York, they are attack dogs. They are known as, you know, some of the best, if not the best uh, prosecutors in the country. And the fact that they worked so hard to get this case on some, you know, we can argue about whether it even makes sense 
to be prosecuted in the Southern District of New York. It's kind of a random place. Um, but, you know, the fact that it's being prosecuted there with this judge, with these, um, you know, uh, assistant um, AGs, like it, it's just, yeah, that, it, that does not square cast with my read. And just in, to push back on that uh, jurisdictional issue, I do want to bring up the point that um, we had Cynthia Cooper on the show. Uh, gosh, mm-hmm. I don't know, maybe maybe it was a year ago now. Um, and she was an auditor for the company WorldCom, which collapsed due to fraud. And that was also tried in SDNY, from what I can remember. Mm-hmm. And the reason being money. Like, that's yeah. the reason. I mean, financial crimes are frequently, they're the best at this kind of a thing. I'm more just saying that, like, these are the best at prosecuting this kind of a thing. And they didn't put him in some random courtroom somewhere. They, you know, found a way to get him in the best courtroom um, or the worst you know, for him. I mean, it's useful for the Southern District of New York that, like, jurisdictionally at a certain level, such a huge portion of dollar transactions happen to run through banks in their jurisdiction. They end up getting to say, yeah, look, it, there's our nexus. It's right there to just about anything they want. The nexus is Wall Street, baby. Are you happy it's coming to an end? Are you sad? Are you bit- Is it a bittersweet moment or are you you done with this? Yeah, I mean, it's it's been crazy. It's It's been a really professionally um, positive experience for me. I mean, I can't say, um, like just meeting all these, you know, really brilliant people that I've been reading for a long time, working with my great colleagues, you know, seeing our justice system, um, and how it works, um, for an extended period. It's like watching the director's cut too of a movie like, um, that I've seen and know really, really well, and now get to kind of lift the curtain on. So for all those reasons, it's positive, you know, but it is like, you take a step back, you know, there, you say what you want about Sam Bagman free. There's a guy's life that's kind of at stake here, um, or a, a big part of it. Um, and it, it feel, you know, the atmosphere around it can feel a little bit odd at times, like, cause it is fun being with your friends at like this kind of a camp sort of setting almost like as we're waiting every morning, but I'm excited I, and seeing his parents, like whatever role they had, like they can't be having a good time so it's just you know um it, it's a lot of people um you know the one person hurt or several people hurt a lot of people but they're getting hurt too and kind of just seeing it all play out it's not really the most uplifting <laughs> environment um as for articles please read our coverage we cover it live every single day on coindesk we have these articles that we just flesh out with as much detail as we can um and then we do a newsletter that you can also subscribe to on our site um where we kind of do some more of like a step back take of what happened and what to expect um i mentioned liz lapato's article um katie baker's another awesome um reporter um who's been covering this every day for the ringer um there's so many you know there, there's tons of really really great um no need to shill for them they can shill themselves when they come on the podcast <laughs> um oh yeah they were no. both literally on the podcast so i should well, no, we're, find other people fingers so, crossed yeah. that we get liz lapato soon but yes katie katie's been on um okay uh, and, and, I, and liz has been on before just before. for the trial before. yes 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 thank you for coming on sam it was a pleasure to have you uh and as for the, I know there's an ongoing case, uh, Cast Coin versus the Department of Justice, and I will be taking the stand. Uh, and I, the gag order does not apply. You're, you're suing the Department of Justice. <laughs> Sorry, I guess I'm. That's how involved in the. That's how involved in my own case I am right now. Um, I have not taken the I mean, advice really, of, lawyer, of case. my lawyers. She's already uh, spoken against me. Yeah, anyway, thank you. Thank you, Sam. It's been a pleasure to have you on. Thank you, guys. This is a lot of fun.